Good afternoon, everybody. Hope everyone's having a great day. Um, thank you for hopping on here with us today um, where we're going to have Adrian Messer um, from UE Systems do a, uh, a webinar showing you guys how to create a STEAM report out of DMS. So um, we're hoping this will everybody will enjoy that. Um, typical housekeeping for these webinars, so I am recording this, so you can um, take a listen to this again later. We'll have it up on our website um, if you want to refer back to it as you're starting to do your own reporting out of DMS. Um, be a great resource for you, or of course if there's folks that uh, that you work with that couldn't make it, they can definitely check it out later. Um, we definitely encourage asking questions, uh, so, def so take advantage of that. There's the little question box window, so I'll be monitoring those questions as they come in and getting those uh, tossed over to Adrian so he can answer those for you. Um, and of course, you know, any questions or, or help that anybody needs on our software, um, you can always reach out to anybody here at UE Systems and, and we'll get you taken care of. So keep that in mind as well. Um, you know, we are doing this live, so bear with us if we run into any technical issues, sound or, or otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll try and get it squared away as quickly as we can, um, but hopefully that won't be the case today. Um, so let me change the screen here, Adrian, over to you, and we'll okay. let you get started. All right, excellent. Uh, let me get this pulled up here. Okay, everybody see that? Maureen, is that good? Looks good. Okay, great. Well, again, welcome, and uh, whether you're on the live event today or uh, watching the recording, we appreciate you taking time to learn more about steam trap inspection with ultrasound and the associated reports. Now, if you were looking for a CBM technology where uh, you can show a very quick return on investment, there are two applications for which ultrasound can be used to do just that. One is compressed air and compressed gas leak detection, and that is the easiest thing you can do with ultrasound. And it, it is the one uh, where you can show a very quick return on investment. And UE Systems has made it even easier because we have an app that you can download in uh, Google Play and iTunes where you can generate the associated cost savings uh, with those compressed air and compressed gas leaks uh, right from your phone or your tablet. And it's very typical for us when we're in a plant or facility, within just a few hours, we can typically find enough compressed air or compressed gas leaks to more than pay for the cost of the ultrasound equipment. Uh, very easy to do and the app makes it even easier. The second application is steam trap inspection. And these are gonna be real dollars where you can show some very quick savings associated with finding any failed or leaking steam traps. Now, the Department of Energy has some energy facts associated with steam. And they say that in a typical facility, you can realize as much as 20% savings just by improving the steam system itself. And one way to improve the steam system is to maintain properly operating steam traps. And then another rule of thumb, uh, very similar to what the air compressor companies will tell you with compressed air. With compressed air, they say approximately 30% of the air generated at the compressor is lost to leaks. Well, with steam, they say it's around 20% of the steam that's generated at the central boiler is lost via leaking steam traps. So again, with, with energy costs the way they are, uh, I've heard numbers uh, anywhere between $8 and $14 per 1,000 pounds of steam. Uh, depends on where you are, how the steam is produced, you know, the fuel, uh, and also you know, how clean the steam has to be. Uh, it can be very expensive. And uh, another rule of thumb is if it's been longer than three to five years since you've had a steam trap survey done or you've performed a steam trap survey uh, to inspect those steam traps, then as much as 50% of the steam traps can be failed, whether they be leaking by or failed open. So very important that we go out and inspect on, our, on a regular basis those steam traps. 
it's also important to realize that one technology can't do everything. Uh, we're not talking about simply relying on uh, temperature measurements or we're not relying solely on ultrasound, but it's a combination of ultrasound and, and infrared or temperature measurements um, to inspect our steam traps, along with awareness and safety. Um, you know, faulty steam traps uh, can lead to condensate backup. When you have condensate backup in your system, that can lead to abnormally high pressures, even uh, severe cases of water hammer. Uh, and occasionally you'll hear uh, they'll make news uh, when you have these uh, steam system you know, explosions, these ruptures in the steam system. And uh, hopefully nobody's around when that happens, because if, if people are in that area when that happens, it's not a good thing. It doesn't make for a good day at that facility. Uh, training and education. Educating people on the importance of proper steam trap and steam system maintenance. And then reporting and documentation. Uh, reporting and documentation has become very critical for maintenance and reliability professionals. And if there's anything that I can see in the many plants that I visit on a, a weekly and a monthly basis is uh, reporting and documentation can be done better. So in this case, hopefully we're going to go out and we're going to find these failed steam traps. We're going to generate the associated report. So not only can we say, hey, we found 30 steam traps that are filled, but we can show real dollars for how much those steam traps are costing if they're leaking by or failed open. So the purpose of an ultrasonic steam trap survey should be to identify and correct faulty traps that can negatively impact energy use and cost. Um, again, these are going to be real dollars. Uh, it's probably the second easiest application that you can do with ultrasound aside from compressed air and gas leak detection. I mentioned safety. Um, you know, if you have many failed traps uh, that are either in the failed closed position or failed open, uh, of course, you're going to have higher than normal temperatures if they're failed open. If they're failed closed, that leads to the condensate backup, higher pressures, water hammer, and then you have a higher risk for those uh, those ruptures in the steam system. And then some of you may be in facilities to where failed traps can lead to um, impurities with uh, your product or product quality issues. Uh, so again, maintaining proper steam temperatures associated with those products uh, can help you to improve your quality. And then we're going to really talk about the reporting and documentation. And I'll pull up and I'll show you an example report of how we're able to generate that report with the information that we need from both our temperature measurements and our ultrasound uh, testing. So when we go out to perform the survey, I mentioned temperature measurements and ultrasound, but we also want to do a visual. Um, you know, just inspecting the steam system, uh, any issues related with the steam system. Hopefully all of your steam traps have strainers installed where you can routinely uh, blow down those strainers to remove any contaminants. And also, if you are finding a lot of contaminants when you uh, blow down those strainers, um, then you may have some other issues uh, where th that may need some attention. You know, if you have corrosion or if you have dirt or, you know, um, chemical buildup inside of your steam system, uh, there may be some other issues uh, that may need to take priority aside from just inspecting the steam traps. So we're going to do a visual. We're going to take a look at the installations. We're going to note any um, any areas where we may have some opportunities uh, for missing insulation around the steam uh, pipes and the steam traps. And we're going to talk about temperature measurement and why we need to take temperature measurements. Uh, one is for our report. Uh, we'll talk about the inlet temperature and outlet temperature and what that means as far as uh, uh, equating that to a pressure. And we're going to talk about ultrasound, where do we make contact, and then what are we listening for. Uh, it is a contact application, so where you have airborne applications like compressed air and compressed gas leak detection, airborne electrical, to where we're listening for corona tracking or arcing, and we're listening for that sound through the air. Uh, steam trap inspection is going to be a contact application. So we're going to make use of the stethoscope module or the, the contact probe, as we call it, 
uh, and we're going to make contact at a certain point on that steam trap to be able to listen what's taking place inside of that trap. Is it operating properly? Is it leaking by? Or is it failed open or failed closed? Now, the source of the ultrasound when it comes to any leak detection application is turbulence. So with compressed air or compressed gas leaks to atmosphere, you have something inside of that pipe, that gas that's under high pressure that's trying to exit out through a crack or orifice out to low pressure or atmosphere. That creates turbulence, and that's what we hear with that airborne scanning module. With steam traps and valves, we're listening for internal turbulence. So when that steam trap, if it's, say, an inverted bucket trap, and we're making contact on the outlet or the discharge side of it, we're going to be able to hear if that trap is cycling open, and then we're going to hear it shut. So we're listening for the turbulence of when that steam trap opens and then uh, releases and then shuts back. Uh, if the trap is supposed to be in closed position, we shouldn't be hearing much of anything. Uh, but if there's any kind of subtle leak by across that uh, orifice, then we're going to be able to hear that on the outlet or the discharge side of the trap because, again, that leak by across that orifice is creating turbulence on the outlet or the discharge side, and that's what we hear with ultrasound. So when we talk about temperature, uh, I mentioned infrared, but it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. We're really just wanting a uh, simple-to-use, spot radiometer, something that we can take the inlet temperatures and then the outlet temperatures with, uh, because based off of that temperature, it's going to indicate an estimated steam pressure. And so we'll need to know the inlet temperature and then the outlet temperature for that steam trap. Uh, that's two pieces of information that we need to know in order to generate the report. We'll uh, have one slide specific uh, that will tell you exactly what we need to know for the report. but. Uh, this is going to be an important. So when we go out to do the steam trap survey to inspect those steam traps, we're going to use temperature first. And when we use temperature first, it lets us know that we have steam coming to the trap. So if we get a high temperature, we know we have steam coming to the trap, and then we can proceed to test with ultrasound. Uh, but again, we want to note the inlet and the outlet temperatures. Now with ultrasound, so here you can see uh, this is an UltraProbe 2000 in use here. We're making contact on the outlet or the discharge side of the steam trap. And we're going to use ultrasound to listen to that trap to make sure that it's working properly. And the ultrasound instrument is going to give us two indicators. It gives us a visual. So even with the case of the UltraProbe 2000, when that steam trap opens and releases, we're going to see the needle move over to the right. And then once it shuts, we're going to see the needle move back over to the left. If you're using a digital instrument, uh, you'll see a decibel level, and in some cases, a, a bar graph or an intensity meter. So again, when that steam trap opens and releases, you'll see the decibel level and the intensity meter go up. And then once it uh, cycles shut, then we're going to see that decibel level drop back down. Uh, so again, the ultrasound or the ultra probe gives us two indicators. It gives us a visual something that we can see on the display, and then it also gives us an audible, so we actually hear that sound in our headset while we're doing the inspection. Now, if you have an instrument that has frequency tuning, uh, I mentioned the UltraPro 2000, uh, that instrument, um, as long as it's been around, it does have frequency adjustment. So starting with the UltraPro 2000, the 9000, the 10,000, and then the 15,000, those instruments have frequency tuning, meaning that we can adjust or set the frequency according to what our application is. So the recommended frequency setting for steam trap uh, inspection is going to be 25 kilohertz. If you're using an UltraProbe 100 or an UltraProbe 3000, that instrument is on a fixed frequency. So the only adjustment that you can make on it is the sensitivity. So the sensitivity, um, those of you that are familiar with our instruments, you can kind of relate that to a volume. So as you know, the higher the sensitivity, uh, the louder the sound is going to be in the headset. Uh, and then you just simply lower that to adjust kind of the volume. Uh, but we can adjust that to get a decibel level reading. Um, but really, it's a gain. So when I increase that sensitivity, I'm increasing the amount of power that's going to those receivers that will then sense or, and receive the sound. So if you're on the lower steam pressure system, you're going to need to have the sensitivity a little higher, just 
simply because there won't be as much noise or there won't be as much turbulence created in that lower steam uh, system pressure. If the steam system is higher, then you we're going to need to lower the sensitivity, meaning that there's just simply more turbulence or the more potential for uh, higher turbulence within that steam system because of the higher pressures. But either way, we're going to adjust the sensitivity to where uh, we're going to make it comfortable for us to be able to listen and then hear the operation of the steam trap. So when it comes to the sound characteristics, what can we expect to hear when we go out to make contact with a steam trap? Well, there are many different types of steam traps, but when it comes to ultrasound, there's really two sound characteristics, and that's either going to be an on and off uh, in the examples we have here, like an inverted bucket trap, a disc trap, or a thermostatic trap to where if we're listening to that steam trap, we should hear a very distinct cycling or an open and then a close uh, type sound uh, as that steam trap cycles. The other sound characteristic is gonna be more of a continuous flow. And a floating from the static is a great example of that type of trap. So that type of trap is designed to not cycle open and shut. So it has more of that continuous flow sound, but there should be some sort of modulation. So you have a, a ball float uh, that rides at the bottom of the trap on that condensate. So as that level of condensate changes inside of that floating thermostatic trap, uh, that will give you more of that modulating type sound. So again, it will never shut completely off like your inverted buckets, your disc traps, uh, your thermostatics but you should hear some sort of a modulation. And in some cases, you can actually hear the float inside of the trap. Uh, so it has kind of a clanging-like sound. So if you hear that, then that lets you know that the float is in there. It's doing its job. It, it's regulating the flow of condensate in and out of that steam trap. So our sound characteristics are on and off or continuous flow. Now, re regardless of the type of trap, will we'll always make contact on the outlet or the discharge side of the trap. Now, last week's webinar from Kelly Paffel, uh, which is also archived on our website, uh, he talked about having some thorough, well-documented operating procedures for your steam traps and your steam systems. So you want to plan to be successful. Um, some of the facilities that I go in, especially the, the older facilities to where things have been added to, things have been taken away, uh, buildings have been added onto, uh, in some of those types of facilities, they may not have any clue where all of the steam traps are. So if you're in that situation, it's going to take some legwork to go out and note and find where all of the steam traps are. So you want to plan that out. So that way, once you're ready to actually go out and inspect the steam traps, you know where all the traps are. So plan the survey out. Um, hopefully you have some sort of drawing or a map showing where all the steam lines are in the steam, uh, the steam traps. Um, have some sort of tagging process. Now, in the UltraTrend DMS software, the UltraTrend DMS software can become your steam trap database. Uh, you have the ability to add in uh, specific information for those steam traps. You can enter in the, the type of trap, the manufacturer, the pipe size, the orifice size, even to the point of pictures. Um, you can incorporate pictures of the steam trap, where they are in the facility. You can incorporate all that information right into the UltraTrend DMS software. So uh, that may be a good place for you to, to start building that steam trap database is the UltraTrend DMS software. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, you can download the software right from our website. So uh, set up the tagging system, uh, set up your route in the uh, UltraTrend DMS software. You know, of course, once you know where all of the steam traps are, uh, we're going to get our instrument, we're going to make sure everything's in working order, make sure that it's recently been recalibrated, or make sure that we've been doing the sensitivity validation test uh, if it has just come back from recalibration. Uh, make sure it's fully charged. Uh, it sounds um, something, of course you'd think about that, but you'd be surprised that um, how many times we've gone out to do some training in a plant or facility and we pull out the instrument and nobody's charged it. 
Um, think about think about um, any uh, items that you might need uh, while you're out there. Um, you know, accessibility. You know, uh, it's going to be really a two-person system. So, if you need someone to unlock doors, you know, uh, think about lockout, tagout. Think about ladders. You know, any type of extra PPE that you might need, uh, long sleeves, gloves. You know, anything that you might need. Uh, think about that and um, and have that plan in place before you go out to actually do the inspection. Now you want to make the survey manageable. Uh, so we recommend that you break the uh, the steam trap inspection into zones or areas. Uh, one, it makes it easier uh, on the reporting and documentation. So when we generate those reports, we can kind of see the target areas where we have the greatest opportunities. Uh, for repair, uh, especially in, in areas where you may have higher safety issues uh, associated you know, than other areas. Um, if you have a lot of steam traps that are found to be failed open or leaking by in those areas, obviously they become higher priority. So break the, uh, the uh, survey into zones. So we typically would start in a boiler room, kind of work our way out through the main um, steam production through use, condensate return, um, and then, you know, any other areas uh, in the condensate recovery system where you may have some steam traps. So again, just break it up into zones, break it up into areas. And the only way to do that is once you've kind of gone through and where you know all the steam traps are, and you've done the, the initial legwork in um, setting up that steam trap database. So some conditions to note while we're out doing the survey. Uh, oversized steam traps, um, they will barely open when condensate reaches it. So if they're oversized, they don't have the capacity to fully open and then release all that excess condensate. Undersized steam traps will cycle too often. So a good rule of thumb for a, a disc style trap, that disc style trap should cycle about every 10 seconds. Uh, inverted bucket traps will cycle approximately every 15 seconds or so. Um, so if they're cycling more often than that, then uh, it may be safe to say that that steam trap is undersized. You know, I talked about, um, you know, your strainers. You know, if you have these wire-drawn control valves that are constantly open, condensate impurities, impurities uh, you know, sediment, rust, contaminants, they're only going to wear the seat out. and Therefore, uh, you know, if that seat continues to wear, then that will never, never close. Um, undersized condensate lines uh, potentially create high back pressure. Uh, traps installed backwards. Uh, I've actually seen this with my own eyes. Um, so hopefully the people that install your steam traps know how uh, to install the trap properly. Uh, make sure they know uh, the, which way the flow is going to make sure that it's installed correctly. Uh, I've even seen some traps that are installed upside down. Uh, so just knowing how to install the steam traps properly, and uh, that's part of that visual inspection that we talked about earlier. And then low steam temperatures due to flooded condensate lines. Again, that's some of the potential there when you have traps that are in the failed closed position, condensate's going to back up. Therefore, uh, that'll lead to excess condensate in, in the lines, creating lower steam temperatures. Now, uh, possible signs of steam trap failure. Um, so if traps are in the failed open position, you're going to have an abnormally warm boiler room. So again, that boiler is having to constantly run to keep up with the demand on the system. A condensate receiver that's vending excessive steam. Um, so when you drive into your plant or your facility, if you see that steam vending to atmosphere uh, more than it should be in some cases, great indicator that you probably got some failed traps somewhere. A uh, condensate pump water seal that's failing prematurely. Again, if we're having excess condensate in the uh, the steam system, of course, it's gonna that pump's gonna run more than it should. Uh, the condition space is overheating or underheating. Uh, boiler operating pressure is difficult to maintain, so just by simply looking at those boiler controls can give you an indicator that you may have some uh, steam trap issues. Uh, vacuum in the return lines is difficult to maintain. Uh, again, if you have that excess condensate, that will um, not lead to that condensate draining uh, properly. 
And I talked about water hammer. And I'm sure uh, any of you that are on the call today or on the, uh, the webinar today um, have probably seen cases. If you've worked around steam long enough, uh, you've probably seen severe cases of water hammer. A uh, good water hammer or um, water hammer um, is typically caused by steam traps that are failed um, or failed or failing, I should say. Okay. And sorry about that. All right. Now, I talked about the orifice location, where we're going to make contact. Um, this uh, can be made available to you. It's also in our steam trap inspection guide. So I talked about all the different types of traps, but regardless of the type of trap, we're, we'll always make contact with our ultra probe uh, at the discharge orifice of the trap. So this is just some typical types of traps here. So you can see uh, here's the inverted bucket up in the top left corner, uh, our disc style trap. Uh, we see some thermostatics there. Here's our uh, floating thermostatic down here. So typically you'll have uh, an inlet coming in at the top and then outlet down on the bottom. And that's the, the one there in the lower left-hand corner. So once we're at the steam trap, so we, we've done the planning. We know where all the traps are. We've built our steam trap database, uh, either in the UltraTrend DMS software or some other program that you use. We, we know what PPE we're going to need. We're, we're ready to start the inspection. So once we're at the trap, then there's some decisions that we have to make. Is the steam trap operating? If so, we're going to make sure that the valves are open. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take out our spot radiometer and we're going to check with temperature. Now, if that temperature is cold and then the temperature is hot, there's some other decisions that we then need to make. So if the temperature is cold, we need to determine if the trap is failed closed or plugged or not in service. So if it's not in service, then we need to note that or we need to note the reasons why it's not in service. If the temperature is hot, we're gonna note the inlet and the outlet temperatures and then we're gonna proceed to test with ultrasound. So if that temperature is hot, and we are, have, have identified what type of trap it is, we're gonna to proceed to make contact on the outlet or the, the discharge side, uh, wherever it's appropriate for that type of steam trap. And we're gonna be listening to the operation of the trap. Now, if the trap is continuous flow, that's gonna be our floating thermostatic. If the trap is an inverted bucket, a thermodynamic or a disc or a thermostatic, we should hear a very distinct cycling uh, open and then close. So I mentioned rule of thumb for a disc style trap is approximately every 10 seconds. Inverted buckets, uh, depending on the size, but they'll typically uh, cycle about every 15 seconds. So once we've made contact and we, we're listening with ultrasound, uh, based off of what we hear in the headset, we're gonna be able to note if the trap is working properly, if the trap is supposed to be cycled closed, we'll be able to determine if it's leaking by because uh, even if the trap is closed, you know, that sound that we hear should pretty much go away. But if we still hear that subtle leak by of steam across the seat of the trap, then we'll note that the trap is leaking by. If it's failed open, we will hear no cycling whatsoever. It will just be a constant blow through of steam across the seat of the trap or is the trap failed closed? And our temperature readings will be a good indicator for the trap if it's failed closed. So we should have a very, um, should be very hot on the inlet side, and then should be much cooler on the outlet side. So we're gonna note the condition of the trap, and then now we have all the information that we need to do our reporting and documentation. Now, for the steam trap that you generate through the UltraTrend DMS software, this is the information that you need to know in order to generate that report. Now, if you're using the UltraProbe 10,000 or the UltraProbe 15,000 instrument, you can enter all this information right on board the instrument. Uh, so if you're using the UltraProbe 10,000 and you've enabled the steam application, uh, down on your lower menu across the bottom of the screen, you'll see a, an option that will say press enter for steam info. 
So when you press enter there, that will take you to a screen where you can enter in all this information. The UltraBook 15,000 is very similar. So uh, if you're using the 15,000, we're gonna look for an icon that looks like a little pencil that says input data. So if you've enabled the Steam or the Valve application, you'll be able to go to input data and you'll be able to enter in the type of trap, the orifice size, the inlet temperature, the outlet temperature. We'll note the operating condition. Again, we're gonna put in if it's okay, that means it's working properly. We're gonna put in if it's leaking by, if it's failed open or blowing straight through, either plugged or not in service. So again, we can enter that operating condition right on board the 10,000 or the 15,000. Now for the orifice size, um, hopefully that is gonna be on the nameplate of the steam trap. Um, so if it is, that's great. If the orifice size is unknown, you can Google or search the particular type and model number of the steam trap to get the orifice size. You can also estimate it based off of the pipe size, but uh, a rule of thumb uh, from what I've heard from uh, a lot of uh, experts in steam systems, uh, you can default and use one eighth of an inch. So if you've exhausted all other measures and you're still unsure of what the orifice size is, you can use one eighth of an inch. Uh, evidently, one eighth of an inch is the most common orifice size of a steam trap. And then the only other piece of information that we need to know is our cost of steam. That's going to be a dollar amount per thousand pounds. So uh, I guarantee someone at your plant or your facility will know how much it's costing you to generate a thousand pounds of steam. So at this point, I'm going to exit out of here and I'm going to pull up an actual report uh, just so you can see it a little better. So again, this report is generated in the UltraTrend VMS software. So when we set up our route, we create the plant name. Our application will be Steam. And then we're going to create the group or the route underneath our application. And this, that's where we can start entering in the specific steam traps. Uh, and we can build that route. And then once we've created that route, we can then load that into our UltraPro 10,000 or our UltraPro 15,000. And we're ready to go out to do the inspection. So once we've stored that data on the UltraProbe uh, while we're doing the inspection, inspection, we can then take that data down the back into that same route in our UltraTrend DMS software. And then we're gonna go over to reports. And then one of the reports here uh, within that STEAM application is the STEAM report. So based off of the information that we put in to the UltraProbe, uh, this is the, and when we generate the report, this is the first tab that comes up. So here's where we can enter in our cost of steam. So again, there's the dollar amount per thousand pounds. It gives me the total cost, so how much these steam traps are costing me based off of if they're leaking by or if they're uh, failed open. Now, our software, the report, is made to err on the conservative side. So the actual savings are going to be a little bit more than what this reports, mainly because we're using the temperature to estimate the steam pressure. So there's a little bit of a, um, uh, I guess, a conservative estimate of that steam uh, pressure based off of the temperature. Now, we're going to assume that if the trap is leaking by, it's leaking by at 50%. And we're going to assume that if it's failed open and you're blowing straight through live steam, we're going to assume that it's blowing through at 100%. Now, if you want to make it more conservative, we can change these percentages, and that in turn will change your cost. And we're going to assume that the steam system is running 24-7. So our hours of operation here are 24, uh, 365. So the number that we're seeing here is on an annual basis or per year. So if I go down to the data tab, here's the actual report from these steam traps that were inspected. So um, here's the information starting here with the type of trap, uh, column I. There's the pipe size, there's the, the orifice size, the inlet temperature, the outlet temperature, which in turn equates or estimates the pressure. 
The test result, we determined um, not only based off of our temperature measurements, but also what we heard in the headset, we determined if the trap was leaking by, if it was blowing through, or if it was okay. And you can see there's the percentages. So at, um, if it's leaking by, we're assuming that it's leaking by at 50%. If it's blowing through, we're assuming that it's blowing through at 100%. So it gives us the pounds lost per hour. And then here is the cost for each individual trap. So you can see here that some of these uh, are very expensive. So if you see here, this particular one here, this, um, uh, let's see, this trap, yeah, uh, it's blowing through at 100%, um, not all that high of pressure, but, you know, $5,000 there. And then again, that total for all uh, 14 of these steam traps at $10 per 1,000 pounds, uh, is costing this particular plant or facility a little over $16,000 per year. Uh, so again, very, uh, very quick way, very easy way to show some real dollar savings uh, associated with uh, steam trap inspection program using both ultrasound and infrared. Now, again, just some rule of thumbs from the DOE. Um, you know, while many traps fail with the valve wide open, the actual orifice size could be a fraction of a full open position. So therefore, that's why we might would recommend if you want to get more conservative with the report, you can adjust those percentages. And that's why we allowed you to do that in the report. Um, we talked about how if you absolutely don't know the orifice size, you can default to one eighth of an inch. It's also suggested to assume that a trap has failed with an orifice size equivalent to one half of its fully open position. So again, if you want to adjust those percentages on how much it's leaking by or failed open, uh, you can certainly do that. Now, in just one hour, an unchecked blowing steam trap at 300 PSI steam with an orifice size of 3 sixteenths of an inch will waste 267 pounds of steam. So with an average cost of steam around $12, again, it could be more than that, depending on where you are and then how the steam is produced. One blowing steam trap will waste $77 a day or $28,000 a year. And that's just one steam trap. Um, and if you're in a chemical or you know any kind of uh, a uh, process type facility where steam is heavily used, you know, you may have thousands of steam traps. Uh, and if you just took, if you just said 50% of those are failed open, it can lead to some serious dollars. So when inspecting the steam traps, again, uh, just some things to note, uh, is the system at the correct pressure and temperature? Now, you do need to exercise some patience. A uh, good rule of thumb is to listen to a steam trap for about a minute. Uh, now, if you haven't heard any anything within a minute, and if the temperatures are okay, you know, it. we, we don't know how long it may be before that trap could cycle uh, or do anything. Uh, but a good rule of thumb is to exercise some patience and listen to that trap for about a minute. Now, initially, when you're first going out to test the traps, compare similar types of traps. So similar processes, similar types of traps. And that'll give you a quick indicator as to what the sound of the trap should be. Um, and it'll be very obvious when you come across a trap that is in that failed open position or even leaking by. So when it, if it's an inverted bucket, for instance, it will never cycle completely shut um, if it's leaking by. So you'll hear that in the headset and it's very, uh, it will become very intuitive to you. Again, our recommended frequency setting on the Ultra Probe, we recommend 25 kilohertz for testing steam traps. Uh, while we're on this slide, uh, for any of you that uh, would like to know the frequency setting for other applications that we recommend, uh, we recommend a frequency setting of 40 kilohertz for airborne applications. So airborne being compressed air leaks, compressed gas leaks, vacuum leaks, even steam leaks to atmosphere, that's gonna be an airborne scanning module application. Uh, airborne electrical, where we can listen for corona tracking and arcing uh, through the air around an energized electrical cabinet. Uh, that frequency setting would also be 40 kilohertz. For bearings and mechanical types of applications, we recommend a frequency setting of 30 kilohertz. 
And then for the steam traps and valves, we recommend 25 kilohertz. We're going to adjust the sensitivity to eliminate any background noise that may be just inherent to the system. So if you've ever been through any of our level one training, uh, we talk about valve leak detection, it's kind of similar to a steam trap inspection. So with valves, we recommend an A, B, C, D test method. So what we're doing is we're comparing the decibel level readings at four different points along the valve. So our A point is going to be just somewhere further upstream of the valve. Our B reading will be closer to the inlet side of the valve. C will be on the outlet side of the valve. And then D on the uh, just a little further downstream of the valve. So if we're comparing the decibel level readings at the four points across that valve, if we have a valve that's in a leak by condition, our higher decibel level will be at the C point. So again, we have flow going through there that's being restricted across that orifice, and that in turn creates the turbulence or the higher decibel level at the outlet side. Now, if our A reading or our D reading is the higher decibel level, if it's A, that means the noise is coming from further upstream of the valve. If it's D, that means the noise is coming from somewhere further downstream of the valve. So that's why we're taking those four decibel level readings across that valve. So just some things to note um, or to be aware of when uh, we're testing steam traps, it can be the same way. So if you have a steam trap that's in a failed open position, there's gonna be a lot of turbulence, therefore a lot of noise. And if you have another trap closer to that steam trap that's failed open, you may pick up some competing ultrasound from that trap that's in the failed open position. But obviously, wherever you make contact, and wherever you get your higher decibel level, that's going to be the source of the problem. And then research the type of traps. Uh, sound patterns are different with the types of traps being tested. Uh, we have a sound file recording library on our website. So uh, there are different types of traps. I know there's floating thermostatic, there's disc, there's in pretty bucket. So you can go on there uh, to the sound file recording library and you can hear a, what a good inverted bucket trap should sound like opposed to one that's in the failed open position. The same with the thermostatics and the same with the disc traps. So again, that's on the website. Um, if you would like sound files emailed to you, uh, I don't mind uh, sharing any, any sound files of any types of traps that you'd like the sound files of. So you can just send me an email and I will be glad to, uh, to email you some of those sound files that you're interested in taking a listen to. So testing the steam traps, again, can provide insight into the overall health of the steam system. Finding and correcting failed steam traps will reduce energy waste. And an ultrasonic steam trap testing survey is very quick and can be uh, a very good, accurate indicator of the health of that steam trap. So with that, um, Maureen, we can uh, open it up for any questions that came through. And uh, there, there is my email address, so uh, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. We have uh, a couple of uh, energy guides that we can send to you. Again, the sound files, if you're interested in uh, having some of those sound files um, you know, in your, sound, your own sound file recording library, um, certainly be able and, uh, and willing to share those. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, Adrian. And um, just a reminder to everybody, we were recording this, so we'll have this, um, I'll get this up on our website um, just a little bit right after we hop off of here. So uh, you can check this out again if you need to, to refer back to any of it. Um, so definitely if you've got some questions, um, one, you know, this is a good time to get those in. We did have a couple so far, Adrian. Um, one was, what's the recommended time frame for testing traps throughout a facility? Uh, I would say at a minimum, uh, once a year. Uh, if you're in one of those types of facilities where you, know, you have many types of steam traps, now uh, what I would consider to be many would be into the hundreds, uh, if not thousands, um, then I would certainly would want to rec recommend doing uh, twice a year on those. All right, and what about traps that are hard to reach, you know, ones that are up near the ceiling? What do, what do you suggest for those? Yeah, those are always tough. I kind of talked about that a little bit, you know, just 
when you're out identifying the traps, you know, what type of equipment that you would need. Uh, you know, they don't always put the steam traps in the most easy, easily accessible areas. Uh, we have, uh, with the, the stethoscope modules, you can unscrew the, the tip and it comes with three aluminum extension rods that extend out about 31 inches. If it's beyond that, uh, we have a telescoping pole that has a contact probe on the end of it that will get you out to about seven feet. And if it's farther than that, um, if it's highly critical and you want, you want it to be very easy to inspect that trap, then we have remote access sensors that you can mount uh, that you can get. The standard cable lengths are 12 feet, 25 feet, and 50 feet. We can make those shorter and we can make them as long as 100 feet. Uh, so you could just install the remote access sensor and then you would just plug in from that cable uh, into the ultra probe and you'd be able to, to listen to that trap really without even getting on a ladder or anything. All right, and what about low pressure traps? Can you test those with ultrasound? Yeah, you can test those. Um, I would recommend an instrument with frequency tuning. So I talked about the Ultra Probe 100 and the Ultra Probe 3000. Uh, they're on a fixed frequency that's centered around 38 kilohertz. So it's kind of optimal for both the contact and the airborne applications. Um, but uh, if you saw the slides, I mentioned it a couple of times that we really recommend a frequency setting of 25 kilohertz. So the lower frequency is going to be able to give you a better, um, I guess, listener, if you will, to the, the lower steam pressures. But yeah, certainly you can inspect the lower pressure steam traps with ultrasound. Uh, would just recommend an instrument with frequency tuning. Uh, and that would be starting at our Ultra Pro 2000 and above uh, would have those, that capability. All right, and someone wants to know, um, is it better to test temperature on traps with infrared or some other recording device rather than using the, the Ultra Probe 15,000? Or, of course, if you don't have a 15, what, what do you suggest? Yeah, so if you're using a spot radiometer, uh, just keep in mind the, the field of view on those. So, again, kind of going back to those steam traps that are up in the ceiling, you know, we really can't stand at the floor with a spot radiometer and shoot up and measure or get an accurate temperature of that steam trap. Uh, just keep in mind the field of view. So the farther you are away from that object that you're trying to measure, the bigger that radius or that circle is that it's kind of taking an average of those temperatures. On the Ultra Pro 15,000, that ratio is 10 to 1. Um, I don't know what uh, how how far how far they go up uh, as far as the ratio, uh, but I know on the 15 it's 10 to 1. Um, probably an infrared camera. Uh, if you if you have an infrared camera, um, like I would say a more advanced infrared camera uh, that uh, that you have access to, that's probably going to be a better uh, better at measuring the temperature measurements than a spot radiometer. Uh, yeah, one thing to just keep in mind is uh, if you're looking at those spot radiometers is the field to view ratio. Again, the farther you are away, the bigger that circle is because it's going to be measuring again, an average of the temperatures within that radius. All right. And what about um, what's the procedure for testing steam leaks from flanges? Uh, that's going to be, uh, I, would, I would do airborne first there. Uh, I know from my experience, uh, anywhere around flanges, that's going to be uh, an airborne application. So you would put the, uh, the scanning module attachment into the ultra probe. Um, if you're using a frequency adjustment, uh, 40 kilohertz would be the frequency. I would also want to uh, go ahead and put on the uh, the rubber focusing probe just to narrow the field of view down. Plus, that allows me to have a higher sensitivity setting. And if there are any leaks around that flange, uh, you'll be able to hear that with the scanning module. All right, great. Well, that seems to to do it for the questions. And of course, you know, Adrian's got his his email address there. Um, you can get in touch with anybody at, at our offices um, if you've got additional questions. Um, so don't don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we're we're here to help. Um, 
so I'm going to take the screen back from you, Adrian, and just to, to wrap up here with just a couple closing slides. Um, so, you know, STEAM is obviously important to those of you that are on here today, but if any of our other applications are of interest, we do have online training courses um, that are they're really well done. Um, you can take them, you know, whenever, wherever. So we've got one on mechanical inspections and lubrication, compressed air surveys and electrical inspections. And our STEAM trap <laughs> uh, inspection online training course is coming. Um, we should have it launched here uh, very soon. So, so folks can still take advantage of that. Um, kind of while we're in the steam season um, and uh, so we'll get information out to everybody about that just as soon as we have it ready but uh, stay tuned uh, definitely get in touch with us on LinkedIn join our, our LinkedIn users groups um, just a great place to, to share information and have some conversations with folks that are doing the same things that you're doing um, just to get feedback share <laughs> war stories etc um, and, and get some advice and feedback from from other folks um, and with that, I'll leave our contact information up here. So if, again, folks can can get in touch with us if you want any more information. Uh, like I said, we'll have this recording up on our website so you can check it out and uh, also see all the other um, webinars that we've got archived on there about STEAM, including some kind of case study ones. So there's a few up there from um, a guy at DuPont v. Guidry who's got some real good success stories and good data um, that he can that if you go and watch those it'll it'll kind of give you a good story and good motivation to to get moving on on steam trap inspections if you're not already doing it so check those out hit us up with any questions and uh, we'll be in touch about upcoming webinars and we'll hope to see you there thanks again Adrian thank you, thank you.